scripture lesson comes from Hebrews, the 11th chapter, selected verses. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past age-bearing years, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jetheth, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned for something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. John Webster, in his book, Confronted by Grace, uh, Meditations of a Theologian, upon which the, the past couple sermons have been based, the, he, he says that the trap is thinking that faith is some sh- sort of special power uh, that we have, or at least that we think we ought to have. Wow. Who here has ever thought along those lines? Who's ever thought, my faith isn't strong enough. I don't have enough faith. My faith hasn't been moving any mountains, and and I doubt it ever will. My faith doesn't sway God, let alone my normal circumstances. How many of us thought that faith begins with us? Because that's what we're saying when we go down that rabbit hole of wishing we had more of it. If I was a better Christian, if I practiced my faith more, if I read more, studied more, prayed more, served more, visited more, gave more, God would listen to my cries for help more. You ever thought that? You ever been down that rabbit hole? Those those mountains would be moving and and the healings would be happening and, and those crises would be averted. If only my faith were where it should be. You ever lamented that your faith wasn't even to the level of a mustard seed? I know I have. I have been privileged to pray for healings for people, and bam, that healing has happened within days of my prayer for no medically justifiable reason. It was none other than miraculous. And I've given God the glory for that. But I've also prayed, and and I've prayed for healing, and and nothing has happened. And and I've wondered, what the heck? Why why this one and, and not this one? What's wrong? See, about the time we think that our faith is insufficient, we've fallen into the trap. Because we fool ourselves into thinking that faith begins with us. That faith is what we make it to be. And it isn't. And and I I need you to hear that. Faith is not what we make it to be. It doesn't begin with us. Faith begins with God. God is always the one calling us to trust. Faith is is listening for God and to God. And and trusting that we're not going to be misguided. Abram was called into the land of promise. Moses was called 
to lead. Rahab was called to welcome. Gideon was called to conquer. David was called to kingship. We too are called. God initiated faith within each of them just as God initiates faith within us. Initiates faith and, and they trusted that which they could not see. We've all heard that faith without works is dead, right? The idea being that if you really believe, your, your life is going to reflect your belief. In other words, we can't see faith, but we can see the results of faith. We can see the results of, of loving others as God first loved us. Obedience to the commandments of God is measurable. A life of worship is obvious. A life of hospitality is evident. A life of discipleship is discernible. A life of service is tangible. A life of generosity is palpable. But here's the problem. If, if we continually try to limit faithfulness to that which is proven, we end up making faith about a checklist. And once it becomes a checklist, it becomes about us. And once that happens, the power and presence of, of, of faith is transferred from God to us, and it becomes powerless. We've replaced the Almighty with something else, the means that we put into place for confirming God becomes the object of our worship. That checklist is what we live for. And we do that because it's something that we can deal with. Webster says that, that religion is sin when it makes God into something that we can handle. Folks, it's God who, who moves us from ignorance to assurance from doubt to destiny, from fear to faith. God is the source of all things hoped for and all things unseen. God is the presence of faith and the power of faith. And we no more control that than we control the rising of the sun. Faith, push comes to shove, faith is all about living within the realm of hope. Hoping that God's promises are real hoping that God is good, hoping that God is just, hoping that God is trustworthy and true, hoping that God is gracious and merciful, hoping that God is love. And let's be honest, there comes some tension with all that hope. Because what if, what if it's not right? See, we have to accept God on God's terms. It's not the other way around. We've got to take God at God's word. And there's tension in trusting that which we can't see because we are almost always going to default to what we can see. And, and so learning to live with that tension is hard to do. The, the, the tension describes that indes inescapable way in which we live our lives in relationship to God. Faith is accepting God's call to go and to linger in that land of promise. See, we spend so much time trying to fit in, so much time trying to belong, so much time trying to prove that we're just like everybody else. Faith calls us to learn to live in exile. Kristen Witherall offers four suggestions for learning to live in exile. First, she says, we are, we are to live faithfully by participating. See, we are where we are, folks. This is our lot in life. Okay, We make the best of it with the opportunities that are at our disposal. And we work to change it if we don't like it. But, but just because we aren't where we want to be, if we aren't where we want to be, doesn't mean that God doesn't have work to be done. We always have something to learn. We always have something to offer. Wherever we are, we've got to remain active within our circumstances. Secondly, she says, live faithfully by pursuing the Lord. 
Paul said in his letter to the Philippians, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so that somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Everyone knows, I think, that to love someone is to commit to learning as much as you can about them and then supporting them through that. Their joys and their sorrows, their dreams as well as their fears, they need our encouragement. Live faithfully, she says, by submitting to the Father. If you're like me, you have this, this is the way life should be scenarios that go running through your head. Well, we're told in God's Word that Christ submitted to the Father by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Faith is trusting that the Lord is over any circumstance and any outcome. And, and nothing that happens is beyond God's grace to pull us through for the glory of the divine kingdom. Now, that's very different than God causes everything. God does not cause everything that happens. We do well enough with that on our own. But God has the grace and the glory to pull us through whatever happens. And finally, live faithfully by responding to Christ. Christians, we are people living in glass houses. We don't like to think of it that way, but, but that's the truth. Christians live in glass houses. How we respond to hardship reflects our faith. It reflects the importance by which we will hold Jesus' will and Jesus' way. Grumbling gets in the way of others seeing Jesus clearly. So our response should be to cease grumbling. And we can, we can talk about coveting or, or any number of things. There's a whole litany of things that, that we can lift up there. But our response shows clearly where Christ fits. Living faithfully is trusting God enough to let go of the mental, emotional, and spiritual baggage to which we are so extremely attached. And that takes work. There is no such thing as blind faith. Blind faith is foolishness. Think about it this way. <coughs> Have you ever heard of those adrenaline junkies? A couple of you? Okay. All right. Adrenaline junkies, well, at least the one I'm going to lift up, uh, this is a guy who jumps out of perfectly good airplanes, okay? And, and, and he jumps from 25,000 feet without a parachute or, or, or even a wingsuit, and, and that's just nuts, okay? Uh, it, it's suicide, uh, at least in, in my estimation. Um, Luke Akins. Luke Akins recently plummeted from an airplane 25,000 feet without any kind of a parachute and landed neatly in, in a square 100 foot by 100 foot net set up to catch him. He landed at a terminal velocity of 120 miles an hour. That's stupid. I'm sorry. That, that's just, he's got a wife and he's got a four-year-old son and he's jumping out of a plane at 25,000 feet without a chute and he's landing on this little itty-bitty net. There's another side to that story. Akins was very clear, very clear that this stunt involved a ridiculous amount of training. For starters, this 42-year-old has over 18,000 jumps to his name. CNN says that he prepared for this stunt by doing dozens of jumps, each wearing a parachute, and aiming for this 100 square foot target and opening his chute at the last possible moment. And, and throughout his practice jumps, he'd pull the cord at 1,000 feet. He had to get special permission just to do that. Okay, And, and he said in this run-up to the jump that he was consistently hitting a smaller and smaller portion of that 100 uh, square foot net to give him a greater leeway within using the full-size net. And, and what Aiken says is, 
whenever people push the limits of what's considered humanly possible, they are invariably described as crazy. Yep. He says, I'm here to show you that if we approach it the right way, if we test it and we, we prove that it's good to go, we can do things that we don't think are possible. Okay, so the guy still might be insane. But he's got a good point. Proper training will get you to places you never thought possible. Faith is not just a blind leap into the dark. It's always a step that involves risk. It's always going to take you into the land of exile. But it's also based on good and sufficient reasoning. We know what God can do. We've seen what God can do in the lives of others, and, and I, for one, in the life of myself. And I believe that, that God's love is sufficient to get us to the fulfillment of God's vision for my life, for the church, for the whole world. And over time, I've learned to trust that. But it takes work. It doesn't just happen. For those who are faithful with a little, they'll be trusted with more. And, and so we need to be faithful. We need to create those habits that God has initiated for us to help us recognize God's call to go. And, and then, then we've got to trust God to fulfill God's promises. I, for one, am choosing to go. And I pray that you will go with me. Amen? Amen. One of the first opportunities God gives us to go is when Christ calls us to his table. Jesus invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Christ invites to his table all who come in faith and, and trust in promises that, that God is trustworthy and true. And on that night so long ago when Jesus was gathered in the upper room, he took the simple act of a loaf. And he broke it. Jesus said, this is my body. It's broken for you for the forgiveness of sin. This is our opportunity to trust, to exercise the faith that God has initiated. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all of it in remembrance of me. It's our opportunity to trust the faith that God has initiated. Forgiveness of our sins. The bread and the blood. It's given for you. Not because we've earned it, but because God loves us. Will you pray with me? Most gracious and almighty God, we are not the people that you've created us to be. We don't always love as we ought to love. We don't always live as we ought to live. But you have you've planted a seed within us. It's the seed of faith. And through this sacred act of holy communion we come to your table and we partake of your elements bread and wine, body and blood and that seed begins to grow in faith faith becomes who we are and how we live so gracious God, may, may this bread and this wine become for us the body and the blood of Christ. May we know it as, as well as we know ourselves. 
that your word is trustworthy and true. And that as we dine at this table, as we dine at this table, we will know the power of forgiveness as our lives are set free from sin and death. Help us then, Lord, to live as we ought to live. And all God's people said, Amen. I invite you to take the bread. This is the body of Christ. Take and eat. Take the cup. This cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Take and drink. In faith, you are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Amen? Amen. So now, Christ has invited, to a, him, has invited us to his table. He has offered himself, his body and his blood. He's given us the gift of sinlessness we have been set free to live holy, holy lives. What will you bring to the table? What will you bring to the table of God? Your time and your talents and your tithe. What will you bring to the table of God as a thank you gift for all that God has done? Take stock of your lives and offer to God that which is God's. Let us pray. Most gracious and almighty God, as you speak to our hearts, reveal to us that which we may bring to you. What of ourselves, Lord, can we offer you? It is a fitting sacrifice for all that you have accomplished within our lives. Reveal that and grant us, gracious God, the conviction to give. Bless us, Lord. Bless us and move us to hear those wonderful words of life wonderful words of faith and allow us to go go into that land of exile and live trusting in who you are and all God's people said